Good afternoon. Thank you for being here for worship today. Let's stand up and we'll begin with our first hymn together, 729. Trusting Thee, Lord Jesus, trusting only Thee, trusting Thee for full salvation, great and free. I am trusting Thee for pardon, at Thy feet I bow. Thy grace and tender mercy, trusting now. I am trusting Thee for cleansing in the crimson flood, trusting Thee to make me holy by Thy blood. I am trusting Thee to guide me, Thou alone shalt lead. Every day and hour supplying all my need. I am trusting Thee for power, Thine can never fail. Which thou thyself shalt give me must prevail. I am trusting thee, Lord Jesus, never let me fall. I am trusting thee forever and for. Our order of worship is Matins, page 219. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Praise to you, O Christ, Lamb of our salvation. Blessed be God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. O oh, come, let us worship Him. O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all God. The deep places of the earth are in his hand. The strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, for he made it. And his hand formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. 
for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Blessed be God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. O oh, come, let us worship Him. Our psalm is Psalm number 25 in the front part of your hymnal. We'll read it responsively by verse, beginning with me. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exult over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Who is the man who fears the Lord? Him will he instruct in the way that he should choose. His soul shall abide in well-being, and his offspring shall inherit the land. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he makes known to them his covenant. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distresses. Consider my affliction and my trouble, and forgive all my sins. Consider how many are my foes, and with what violent hatred they hate me. O oh, guard my soul and deliver me. Let me not be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. Redeem Israel, O oh God, out of all his troubles. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. You may be seated for the office hymn, number 419. <laughs>
first reading from Proverbs chapter 30. I've asked you for two things. Don't keep them from me before I die. Keep vanity and lies far away from me. Don't give me either poverty or riches. Feed me only the food I need, or I may feel satisfied and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and give the name of my God a bad reputation. O oh Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. The second reading from Titus chapter 1. There are many believers, especially converts from Judaism, who are rebellious. They speak nonsense and deceive people. They must be silenced because they are ruining whole families by teaching what they shouldn't teach. This is the shameful way they make money. Even one of their own prophets said, Cretans are always liars, savage animals, and lazy gluttons. That statement is true. For this reason, sharply correct believers so that they continue to have faith that is alive and well. They shouldn't pay attention to Jewish myths or commands given by people who are always rejecting the truth. Everything is clean to those who are clean, but nothing is clean to corrupt unbelievers. Indeed, their minds and their consciences are corrupted. They claim to know God but they deny him by what they do. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit to do anything good. O oh Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. The third reading from Luke chapter 22. So they arrested Jesus and led him away to the chief priest's house. Peter followed at a distance. Some men had lit a fire in the middle of the courtyard. As they sat together, Peter sat among them. A female servant saw him as he sat facing the glow of the fire. She stared at him and said, This man was with Jesus. But Peter denied it by saying, I don't know him, woman. A little later, someone else saw Peter and said, You are one of them. But Peter said, Not me. About an hour later, another person insisted, it's obvious that this man was with him. He's a Galilean. But Peter said, I don't know what you're talking about. Just then, while he was still speaking, a rooster crowed. Then the Lord turned and looked directly at Peter. Peter remembered what the Lord had said. Before a rooster crows today, you will say three times that you don't know me. Then Peter went outside and cried bitterly. O oh Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Forever, O oh Lord, your word is firmly set in the heavens. Death, he was delivered for the sins of the people. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven and whose sin is put away. He was delivered up to death. He was delivered for the sins of the people. We have an advocate with the Father. Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. He was delivered up to death. He was delivered for the sins of the people. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So just imagine that the worst moment of your life, the most embarrassing situation you were ever in, the most humiliating moment of your entire life being recorded in the best-selling book of all time. 
That's the mirror we're looking into today, the mirror of the passion and Peter's denial of Jesus. And everybody who's ever been a believer, every, anybody who's ever confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior has either heard about this or they've read about it in the Gospels. That moment when Peter denied his Lord three times just the way that Jesus said. Imagine everybody knowing about that moment in your life. You know, it's kind of interesting that it is recorded for us in the scriptures because you, you have to wonder, how did they know? How did they find out that this happened? It seems that only Peter was there at the house of the high priest. He was one of the only one of the disciples who followed Jesus after his arrest. He's there by the fire. How did Mark and Matthew and Luke find out what happened? Well, one possibility is kind of told in Taylor Caldwell's book, Dear and Glorious Physician. And there, in this work of historical fiction, she portrays Luke as almost an investigative reporter. He's a journalist, and he wants to make sure that he has the account of Jesus correct. And so he goes and he talks to all the people who had seen Jesus or heard Jesus teach, or experienced his miracles. Maybe that's what Luke did. Maybe he talked to that servant girl, or one of those who was around the fire and heard the story. Maybe he talked to Peter himself, and Peter talked about it. Maybe it was one of the other disciples. After the resurrection, the disciples went fishing, and there on the Sea of Galilee, Jesus has a little campfire and they see him alive again on the beach. And Jesus has a private conversation with Peter. That's when he asks Peter three times, do you love me? And maybe the disciples saw that and they asked Peter afterwards, so what were you talking to Jesus about? And maybe he told them the story. Maybe he told them what happened that night. You know... Peter was so sure of himself. He was so confident in his faith. When Jesus said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. But you really never know how you're going to react until the moment comes. You can prepare yourself mentally, physically, emotionally for something. But until you're there, you really don't know what you're going to do. You know, we know Peter was ready to fight. In fact, in John's gospel, it's Peter who has the sword. And he's the one swinging it around. And he's the one who cuts off the ear of the high priest's servant. You know, he's ready. He's ready to do exactly what he said. But he wasn't ready for the question. He wasn't ready when just a servant girl, somebody that's not even named, simply says to him, or actually she doesn't say it to him, she simply says, this man was with him. And then somebody else says to Peter, you're one of them. And then a little bit later, somebody else says, well, certainly this man was with him, for he's a Galilean. Peter wasn't ready for that at all. And he responds, woman, I don't know him. Man, I'm not one of them. I don't know what you're talking about. Just like Jesus said. Denied knowing Jesus three times, and the rooster hasn't even crowed yet for morning. You know, there's some, there's some verses in the Bible that are kind of haunting that, that I always think of when I read about Peter's denial. One of them is when Jesus says in Luke chapter 12, Everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man will acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before men, will be denied before the angels of God. 
That's a pretty heavy verse. Paul wrote about that when he was writing to Timothy. He said, if we deny him, he will also deny us. And then Paul wrote these words to Titus. He talked about those who profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. That sounds pretty threatening. That sounds like you better learn how to be faithful. You better be ready for the questions. You know, and it makes us wonder if we're ready. It makes us wonder what we would do if we were in Peter's shoes. Now, a lot of times when we talk about this, our minds race to the worst case scenario. A gun to your head. What is it? Renounce Christ or die. Or perhaps it's a job situation. We'll give you the job, but you have to work Sunday morning. What are you going to do? But these aren't really the kind of things that happen to us. What happens is somebody simply says to you, you're a Christian, right? Immediately you tense up. The hair goes up on the back of your neck because you don't know what's coming next. And it's not always bad. Sometimes they say, you're a Christian, right? They just want to know what church you go to. Or maybe they'll say, well, you're a Christian. Could you pray for me or pray for my family? But we always imagine they're going to say something to us like, yeah, you, you're a Christian and you vote for that party? Or, you know, you're, you're a Christian, right? Well, you know, the Bible isn't even true. Uh, you know, people wrote this and we're afraid we're going to end up in a discussion where we can't hold our own, where we're going to look foolish, where, where something's, something's going to happen that just humiliates us. And then we'll be one of those who deny our Lord, and then he'll deny us. So we just give them a tentative yes, kind of wait and see what happens. You know, it's important to remember that Peter was capable of denying his Lord, but he was also very capable of a bold witness of his Lord. You know, Peter's kind of amazing when you get into the life of the early church in Acts chapter 4. Peter and John healed a man who had been able to, hadn't been able to walk since his birth. And so, to find out what happened, they bring Peter and John before the rulers, the elders, and the scribes, the high priest, the whole high priestly family. And Peter, standing before the most powerful people in Jerusalem, says, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you. Well, this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. He really, really just laid it all out about who Jesus was, what they had done, and now what was going to happen. Peter's pretty bold too when one day somebody summons him to the house of a centurion, a Roman centurion named Cornelius. And Peter has had a dream where God has revealed to him that the gospel is for everybody. Nobody's excluded. So he goes to a Roman centurion's home, into a Gentile home. And he is very bold to tell all the people there how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all people, but to us. And we are his eyewitnesses. Peter had a bad day. He had a lot of good days. Just like us, we have some good days and we have some bad days too. We're capable of being pretty powerful witnesses of our Lord. 
and we are just as capable of denying him. Some days, our light shines. Our good works show people that God is real, that Jesus' love is real. They glorify God because we are serving and loving others as if we're serving the Lord himself. Other days, we just want to blend in with the people around us. We don't want anybody to notice us. We don't want to seem any out of the ordinary at all. We hope nobody asks us to give a reason for the hope that we have because we're just, we're just not up to it. You know, and Jesus' response to all that is, I told you. I told you it would be hard. I told you you would fail. But he also told us that he would restore us. He would bring us back, and we would still have a ministry. You know, it's very important that those verses I read before, that we keep them in proper context. You know, when Jesus said, the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God, he was speaking to the Pharisees. He was warning them of the, the yeast of the Pharisees, the teaching of the Pharisees. People who had outright rejected who Jesus was, that he could not be the son of God, he could not be the Christ. He was condemning them, not a moment like Peter's where he just didn't want to say something. You know, Paul was talking about those of the circumcision party, Jewish converts to Christianity who were drifting back towards the old ritual laws of Judaism and the kosher laws and the, the Sabbath laws basically rejecting God's grace in Christ for their old way of righteousness. Totally different situation. And when Paul said, if we deny him, he will also deny us, there's a verse after that that says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. It's his faithfulness to his promises. It's his faithfulness to us and to his father that saves us, not what we do, not how powerful our witness is, but what Christ has done. So as you look at Peter today, it's a mirror, and you can see yourself in Peter. There are those days when you might cave, you might not be strong, you might not know what to say, you might not say anything. There's other days when, like Peter, you might leave your nets and everything else to follow Jesus. And you might stand up and be a very powerful witness, simply telling what Christ has done, his death and resurrection. Maybe to somebody you would never thought you'd meet in your life, you'll have a conversation with. And they will want to hear about who Jesus is. It just depends on the day. But remember, it always depends on Christ, his faithfulness, and what he has done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord, that Luke and Matthew and Mark did record the story of Peter and his failure and also his restoration and also his powerful witness. Thank you, Lord, for the eyewitnesses of the resurrection who didn't let that story go untold very long. They couldn't be shut up. Nobody could keep them from speaking about the things that they had seen and heard. We pray for boldness, Lord. We pray forgiveness when we cave. And we thank you, Lord, for the compelling story we have to tell of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name, amen. We stand for the Tadeum on page 223. Heaven and earth are full of the man. 
majesty of your glory. The glorious company of the apostles praise you. The goodly fellowship of the prophets praise you. The noble army of martyrs praise you. The holy church throughout all the world does acknowledge you. The father of an infinite majesty, your adorable true and only son, also the Holy Ghost, the Comforter. You are the King of glory, O Christ. You are the everlasting Son of the Father. When you took upon yourself to deliver men, you humbled yourself to be born When you had overcome the sharpness of death, you opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. You sit at the right hand of God in the glory of the Father. We believe that be numbered with your saints in glory everlasting. O Lord, save your people and bless your heritage. Govern them and lift them up forever. Day by day worship your name forever and ever. Grant, O Lord, to keep us this day without sin. O Lord, have mercy upon us, have mercy upon us. O Lord, let your mercy be upon us as our trust is in you. O Lord, in you I have trusted. Let me never be confounded. You may be seated as we worship the Lord with our offering.
our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O oh Lord, hear my prayer, and let my joy come to you. Merciful God, we humbly ask you to cast the bright beams of your light upon your church, that we, being instructed by the teachings of the apostles, may walk in the light of your truth, and finally attain to the light of everlasting life. O oh, holy and most merciful God, you have taught us the way of your commandments. We implore you to pour out your grace into our hearts. Cause it to bear fruit in us that, being ever mindful of your mercies and your laws, we may always be directed to your will and daily increase in love toward you and in one another. Enable us to resist all evil and to live a godly life. Help us to follow the example of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to walk in his steps until we shall possess the kingdom that has been prepared for us in heaven. Almighty God, give us grace that we may cast away the works of darkness and put upon ourselves the armor of light now in the time of this mortal life in which your son, Jesus Christ, came to visit us in great humility. That in the last day, when he shall come again in glorious majesty to judge both the living and the dead, we may rise to life immortal. Heavenly Father, God of all conquered, it is your gracious will that your children on earth live together in harmony and peace. Defeat the plans of all those who would stir up violence and strife. Destroy the weapons of those who delight in war and bloodshed. And according to your will, end all conflicts in the world. Teach us to examine our own hearts, that we may recognize our own inclination toward envy, and malice, hatred, and enmity. Help us by your word and spirit to search our hearts and root out the evil that would lead to strife and discord, so that in our lives we may be at peace with all people. Fill us with zeal for the work of your church and the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which alone can bring that peace which is beyond all understanding. Lord, in your mercy, be with Mary Tease and her family as they mourn the death of her husband, Bud. Thank you for his life and his faith and his love. Continue to bring your healing to Jackie and to Joe and to Kim. O oh Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have safely brought us to this day. Defend us in the same with your mighty power and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings, being ordered by your governance, may be righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please stand. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
soul looks back to see the burden thou didst bear when hanging on the cursed tree I know my guilt was there believing we rejoice to see the curse removed we bless the lamp with cheerful voice and sing his 